So I just rolled over 600 miles on my Gen 3, so tonight I'm gonna be doing the oil change as well as a few other things that I think are gonna be important for you to take a look at. However, I would recommend that you go through your manual and check off every box that Kawasaki recommends you look into, adjust, or get looked at by the dealer. A lot of stuff in there, a lot of stuff to go through. All of it's important, but there's just kind of a few things that I wanna go over today because they're things I've either kind of learned about in the past from owning a Gen 2, or things that I've already noticed that needed to be adjusted on my bike here. So first is gonna be the oil change, so I'm gonna clean a little bit of this mess up here before I take any of that off. Doesn't hurt to clean this area up either since I will more than likely bump it when I go to fill this up. And if you don't have compressed air, water would work pretty well too, but you just wanna make sure that this area is clear so none of this ends up back in your clean oil. Now before I take this off, let's just take a moment to admire how giant that plug is and how silly it is to have it hang down so low on a motorcycle that is intended to go off-road. That piece of junk will not be going back on there. Instead, I've got the Tusk Low Profile drain plug here, which is so much smaller. I think it's like a quarter of the size. Comes with a magnet on the end of it. Comes with a crush washer. Uh, you just can't beat it. There'll be a link for this down in the description if you wanna pick one up, which I would highly recommend. So let's get this break-in oil out of here. And before we do, let's take a look at oil level here I think exactly where it was when I picked the bike up so that's a good start and once we feel the threads go over whoo that is some nasty looking oil And all those additives in there are why I actually decided not to change my oil early. As soon as I got my low profile drain plug, I really wanted to stick it in, but I decided, you know what? Kawasaki sticks this stuff in here for a reason. It's supposed to be in there until you hit 600 miles. So honestly, I would not pull it out early, no matter what your oil looks like. It looks like that is starting to slow to a trickle here, but I'll bet you we can find some more oil by leaning this thing over a bit. Look at that. I'm gonna leave that in there. I pretty much do this with all of my machines, but I actually did notice in the Kawasaki manual it mentions that you're supposed to have the bike parallel to the ground. Parallel? They must say perpendicular. <laughs> the Kawasaki manual actually says to have the bike perpendicular to the ground when you're trying to drain the oil out of it, just so you can kind of empty out the pockets that the oil pulls in when it's over on the side stand. I actually usually like to kind of give it a little bit of a lean this way and back and sometimes you get a little more out even. Not a huge deal as the bike kind of gets up in miles and years but obviously during this first break in oil service you are definitely going to be dumping a lot of metal. Metal? <laughs> a lot of metal shavings out of the oil. So while that continues to empty out I'm going to take my oil filter cap off of here so that's just these little two bolts here. Notice that the arrow is facing up. And notice that these are not very tight at all. I'm gonna keep this tight to the bike. While I take these out. I believe those are the same size. Now this is where cleaning this up is gonna come in handy because we don't really have to worry about anything dropping down there, but there still could be a little bit of debris in there, so be careful. Basically what you're gonna have to do is kinda get a finger under this you just gotta kind of work it off. There we go. Keep in mind this is kind of countersunk or sunk, I guess, in there. Woo! So basically you need to pull it straight out. You can't jam it to the side one way or the other to peel it off. So I'm just gonna take this off to the side, clean up any debris that made its way in here, and just kind of inspect this rubber gasket here to make sure everything looks okay. The manual actually does recommend to put a bit of grease on this on, the, on its way back in. Before I pull that filter out, I'm gonna carefully make sure that I Knock any debris on here off and not in. So now I'm gonna pull this old filter out and keep a very close eye on how it comes out. So we've got the smaller diameter 
part of the little flute that sticks in here on the back. That sticks out just about up to the kind of shoulder on it there. You can kind of see it expands a little bit as it goes into the filter. And the front side here, we had kind of the larger diameter that just sticks out just a little bit there. So just like that. Obviously lots of debris in there. Um, some of it with a lot of color on it. I'm not really sure what that's about. Kind of odd. It's like every color of the rainbow in there. It's not exactly what I expected. Sort of weird. So I'm just gonna slide this out and we'll get this cleaned up and insert it into the new filter. And it looks like we've actually still got a bit of debris in there, so I think maybe I'll stick a paper towel in there and clean that out before I stick the new filter in. So now before I insert that in here, I'm just gonna kinda give this a once over just to make sure that there's no manufacturing imperfections, no fuzz stuck to it. And once I'm satisfied with that, I'm just gonna take a little bit of oil and lubricate the gaskets on both sides here. As far as I'm aware, this does not have an in or an out. However, this is very important that you get it the right way. I'm not 100% sure if it'll go in if you put it the wrong way, but I sure wouldn't want to try and find out because the manual says basically if you somehow get it in there that way, you're going to seize your engine up. So we'll go large diameter first here, so you don't have to work with that sleeve at all. I'll push that through just into the point that this shoulder sort of disappears into the gasket. Whoops, and then we'll go too far. There we go. So you can just kind of barely see it poking out there. And of course, smaller diameter portion that's sticking out the farthest is going to go into the motor. This shorter, stubbier side is going to be sticking out towards you. Ease that in. You will kind of have to pick that up a little bit to get that to go in. But then once you can see the little port there, you'll know you're in far enough. So I used a little bit of compressed air and some paper towels to kind of clean this up a bit. That's all looking good inside and out. Before I stick this in though, as Kawasaki recommends, I'm gonna use a little bit of the Bell Ray waterproof grease that I also got from Rocky Mountain ATV to grease up the O-ring on here. I don't know if that's necessarily just to make it slide in easier so you don't scuff it up on the way in or if it's also to kind of help keep the oil in and the water out. Either way, kind of sounds like a good idea to me, so let's do it. I'll gently get this in here without knocking any dirt in. If you give it a push, a little clip in. I would not recommend using the fasteners to do that. Let's stay our finger tight, we'll grab our tool. At this point you want to get your torque wrench out and set it to the required setting in the owner's manual to torque these down. And then if this is finally done dripping down here, we can get that cleaned up and put the new Tusk Low Profile Drain Plug in. So now you want to be certain that you did not leave a crush washer on here and that you've got your new one in place. Gently guide it in there. Now when it comes time to tighten the low profile drain plug, I'm not 100% sure if you were supposed to be following the Kawasaki recommended torque spec or not. As you noticed before, I'm, I'm not real big on torque wrenches. I would say if you're not comfortable doing this, definitely look into it. I would say if you're putting your stock drain plug back in, make sure you follow your owner's manual but I just feel a little bit better kind of getting it just about as tight as I think it needs to be, maybe less a little bit. It's gonna be a lot easier to just keep an eye on it and maybe check it a few times if you're worried rather than overdoing it and stripping it out. And look at that, how beautiful. Now I can ride with confidence around rocks Definitely will feel a little bit better when I get a new skid plate on here that will be coming soon, hopefully. But that is gonna be so, 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 so much better. So now here again, even though I did go through and clean this up, I'm gonna be careful taking this off because there still could be some debris kind of trapped underneath here. I don't want that going in with my new oil. Look at that, nice and grimy. 
So we'll want to get that cleaned up. I'm also going to gently wipe away any of the debris that was left on the mating surface up here. Probably kind of silly that I'm this meticulous about it when you saw the size of the stuff that was in the motor, but it doesn't hurt to be a little cautious. And speaking of caution, we will go ahead and throw it to the wind and I'm just gonna try to dump this in here without a funnel because there isn't really a great way to get a funnel in here. No, it's not Rotella. No, it's not synthetic. That, not a drop. So I don't have any on there yet because I still need to check my level and probably add a little bit of oil yet, but it did look like there was actually a little bit of grease on this O-ring as well. So I think I'll probably throw a little bit back on there once I know that I'm at the right level. But for now, I'm gonna stick this on here just so we don't lose anything down there. Look at that beautiful clean oil. So, yeah, there's a lot in there. I think we'll be okay though. There's a little bit of a bubble at the top and of course need to push a little bit into the oil pump and the filter and everything. So I think we'll double check it later, but I think that should be good. So I'll just go through and clean up all of the residual oil on the motor just to make sure that if there's any oil that I spot later on, I know that it is new oil and not just old oil. And the next thing that you guys are gonna wanna take a look at at this point in time, and fairly often if you ride the bike off-road, is the air filter. And I've actually already got mine swapped for a uni filter with some Bell Ray filter oil spray on it, but it's pretty easy to get in there. This black plastic piece, actually the, the dull part and the shiny part all comes off as one. There's a fast fastener up here, there's a fastener down there, and one more hiding up underneath the rack. Then there's a tab and slot here, so this whole thing just slides back a little ways and you can pull it out. You can still get it out pretty easy, even though I've got the dirt racks rear rack on here. Once that's removed, it looks just like a Gen 2 did. There's just a cover with a Phillips head screw. You pull that out, your filter's stuck in there with a bolt with a wing nut on the end of it. You just pull that out. The filter itself is just a foam material and it's got a little plastic basket inside of it. You pull that plastic basket out, clean that up, and I've actually always got a second filter on hand that is already pre-oiled, so I can just stick that back on that plastic basket and then reassemble the whole thing. Before I stick it in, I usually try to clean up in there a little bit so there's no debris that can make its way inside of the filter because it is kind of a tight fit to get it back in. Once that's all back the way you found it, you can just put the covers back on and you're ready to go. And then I just stick my dirty filter in some hot water with some dish soap, let it sit for a little while, rinse and repeat until it looks clean, squeeze it out until all the water is removed, and then let it sit off to the side in a clean area until it's dry. Once it is, then you can reapply your filter oil of choice. There again, squeeze that out and you want it saturated enough that when you're squeezing it, you are getting liquid out of it. You wanna squeeze as much liquid out as you can. Again, no ringing. Once that's all ready to go, completely covered, but not saturated to the point that you're gonna reduce your airflow, you can just put that in a clean container and it can be ready to go for the next time. And the next thing we'll do here is right over by the shifter. So there's this plug that looks like that and that covers up that nice shiny bolt here. This fastener actually holds your doohickey in place and by cracking it loose, it will let the spring that's in there adjust it so your balance tensioner is set correctly. Or so Kawasaki says. There's a lot of debate about this guy on the internet, but I think doing this during your oil changes is definitely something that can prolong the life of the stock doohickey and the spring and the whole setup in there. And with that loosened up, I'm gonna take my rubber mallet here and just give the case a few wraps just to kind of get things moving in there. Now, I could not actually find in the manual where it says to do this. However, I don't think anything's changed in there since the Gen 2. So I would assume that you could use the same torque spec, but as far as I could tell, it wasn't in there. So I'm just gonna kind of do what I always do here. Okay, apparently with a different wrench though. All right, let's try that again. Yeah, looks like about where it was. After I found out about this and went to adjust it for the first time, I actually found that bolt loose. So I would say that you might want to check that fast every once in a while. Don't overdo it because if you think about what that doohickey looks like, it's pretty thin material. So you definitely don't want to mash it down. Looking up a torque spec for that would probably be a pretty important thing to do and probably something I should have done. 
Now, as for the rest of the stuff, I'm not here to read the manual to you. Like I said, make sure you check it out for yourself. Find the stuff in there that is important to you. I would say it would be a good idea to go through and do it all. One thing that I'd kind of already done is go through and check all the spokes, and I'm definitely not an expert at that. I would say look up a video on that. But basically, all you need to do is just kind of go through them all and make sure that none of them are loose. A lot of the other stuff is honestly things that you should be including in your pre-ride check. Stuff like throttle free play, as you can see in both positions there, it will rest, but there's that little bit of slack. If yours does not have any slop in it, then you'll need to come down here and crack your locking nut loose here and then spin this guy counterclockwise looking at it this direction so it kind of moves up the shaft here essentially adding some slack into that cable and then again you just want it to have that little bit of free play and i've actually needed to do that on this bike already and i had to do that on my gen 2 as well that basically had kind of rattled itself into a bad position where the throttle was actually kind of locking up and wouldn't let me pull it past like an eighth of a turn so if you ever run into that Make sure you check that out. And like I said, definitely something to check kind of periodically as you're riding the bike. And on the other side of the bike, if you give your clutch lever a pull and release it, you should have about a nickel's worth of space between the end of the clutch lever and the beginning of the perch. So if I give this a tap forward, you see that closes up. Adjusting that is also super easy. Basically, you're just going to crack this thing loose and then twist this clockwise in that way to add some slop to this whole setup here. Sounds like it's a cat trapped in the ceiling in here. Now, something that I actually noticed on this the other day before I took it out for a ride that could definitely be kind of a bad thing is that my rear pedal was continually actuating the brake light. And I'm not sure what the deal was, but I actually had to stretch my spring out. Now, I swear I had looked at this at some point, or I feel like I would have had to notice this. So I'm not really sure what the heck happened. If you move this little cover plate here, there is a small amount of adjustment there. You can kind of see some of the threads sticking up. Essentially what that does is changes the distance that this thing has to go to pull down on that little piece of metal you see up there. And what that does when it gets pulled down is basically turns your brake light on here. It's definitely something to check and if you need to make some adjustments you can do that down there. Obviously not something that you want to have on all the time. You want to be able to flash that at people so they don't just rear end you. And now if you ever find that this is in an uncomfortable position, all you need to do is adjust it right there. By cracking this locking nut loose and then adjusting the cylinder by spinning it here, being careful not to damage your seal here, then that will either raise or lower your pedal. Now checking your chain tension is honestly a little bit goofy on here. As you can see on the swing arm here, it's not like the Gen 2. They actually want you to measure from the bottom of your links when it's kind of up at the top position. So you'd measure the bottom here to the bottom of the bottom which is kind of weird. Usually it's top of the top to bottom of the bottom. But when you go to do this, you don't want to brief on it and put a whole bunch of extra pressure. Essentially what you want to do is just kind of lightly take the slack out of it, measure from the bottom here, let it kind of sag down, maybe just drop a finger on it, and then measure from the bottom of there. And that distance from the bottom of here to the top, when it's up here, is going to be your chain slack. And you can find that information again right here. And depending on the type of terrain you ride and how hard you ride, that's something that you should really be checking, again, kind of on a daily basis. After I go on usually one or two dirt rides, I like to clean and lube my chain. I do that with a brush, and then I just kind of lightly spray some of one of these bottles on here. I'm sure Rocky Mountain's got some I can put down in the description. You can also actually use gear oil, supposedly, according to Fortnite anyways. Uh, I've kind of found that. Just spraying a little bit on lightly and then going around the whole chain with a rag is the best way to go. Then you don't end up with so much on there that it ends up everywhere. If you want to help the channel out, take a look down in the description. I've got links for the stuff that I used here today for Rocky Mountain ATV. If you use those links and buy anything on Rocky Mountain ATV, 
they send a little bit back my way since I sent you their way. You can actually join my Patreon for as little as a dollar a month and that will get you access to ad free videos as soon as I get them edited. Or if you just found this video in specific helpful and you want to say thank you, take a look down in the description. You can buy me a beer and say thanks that way. I think that's all I've got for you tonight though guys. Thanks for watching. Hopefully this was helpful to you. Get your bike fixed, get out, ride it, enjoy this beautiful world. Take care, stay safe, and stay swanky.